Welcome back to the D1 Softball Podcast. I'm Jenna Becerra, along my co-host, Amanda Lorenz. Today's episode is brought to us by our friends at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from the youth levels all the way to the pros. And there has been so much going on in the softball world, to say the least, Amanda. Are you ready for this? Oh, I am ready. And I'm ready for the comments, too. Oh, yeah. We're here for it all. We are here for it all. Man, so today's lineup is, you know, the usual. We're going to top talk top 25 rankings. Then we'll head into today's interview, which we are super excited about. Mm -hmm. And then we'll add things with the plays of the week and the win and whiff of the week as well. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into it? Top 25 rankings. So with all the things that are going on in college softball, we are obviously seeing a lot of movement and probably the most we've, we see is in the preseason anyway. So why don't we just take a quick look at what the top 25 looks like this week? Um, so <laughs> there are a few different things. I would say a couple of quick things, Florida state and Arizona, they dropped a few slots, but Arkansas and Kentucky actually had the biggest drops. They now fall below 20. So they're in the bottom four here in the rankings on the other side of things, Virginia tech, UCLA, Florida, South Carolina, Mississippi state, they all rise slightly. And then Cal actually jumps up five slots into the top 20. And then if you look at the top 10, it's actually the same cast of characters. There's just a few shifts and the most obvious big move being Texas going to number one and OU going to number two. Amanda, should we just jump right into the, the questions? Yeah. And I know, I, I don't think that we're going to talk about this in our, in our questions, but I know the number one question will be like, wow, so quick to move OU yeah. out of that top spot. And I mean, it's just so early in the season that we have a limited kind of sample size. Bottom line, they both have one loss. Texas's loss is to a ranked Stanford team who we've talked about how we are huge fans of and we think they're really talented, while OU's one loss is to unranked ULL. And so when you compare them both, unfortunately, um, Texas's loss is just a, a, a better loss than Oklahoma's loss to an unranked team. So when you go with this limited sample size, that's that's it makes it um, easy to know why they got moved to number one. Yes, um, I think very valid arguments for both to be number one. Like I can see both sides of it. And I'll, I'll dig into some of the things that I dug up actually for this one in, in a bit, too. But why don't we why don't we just start with some of the, the questions? So first is, will any mid schools like Miami ever make the top 25? I feel like we love our mid-majors, actually. Um, and there, there is a mid-major school in our top 25. Boston's currently number 24, and this is the third consecutive week that they've been in our top 25. And then Louisiana and San Diego State were actually both in our preseason poll as well. So just to, to clarify on that piece of it, um, and then obviously we we talked today to someone who can speak to this a little bit too. But Amanda, what are your, your thoughts, mid-majors? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the only difference with the mid-major is they need to have a really, really good schedule and produce some big wins. You know, I think it's much harder for them to get looked at to to be ranked in the top 25, but it's not like it's unheard of. Um, they definitely need to be perfect for longer because usually their strength of schedule is not as strong as some of our power five schools, but it's definitely not unheard of. Um, and they definitely will get love. It's happened. And I and think we're going to increase to see more and more mid majors um, get to that top 25 and be contenders against um, these power five schools because our sport is growing so much. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot receive votes too. Like the, what we see is the end product of the votes and all the tallies of everything for the poll. But there are multiple um, mid-majors who are receiving votes from different folks who are submitting these. And since Miami, Ohio was brought up specifically, I just want to say too, like, yes, they played OU really well. They nearly upset them, right? Which would have been historic on top of being historic, given the opening of Love's Field. But they, they have played two ranked teams to this point, Clemson being the other one. If you look at the RPI that just came out, they're number 72, 
whereas there are five other mid-majors who are in the top 25 of RPI, Boston being one of them at 13, Louisiana being another one at 14, and then you have Charlotte, Texas State, and Wichita State too. So to Amanda's point, I do think we'll see more of this movement as we keep going. Absolutely. All right. Why doesn't Duke get shine like the other top teams? Yeah, I think that this is a valid question, right? Um, they're coming in right now um, with a record of 16 and one, and that one loss is only to Oklahoma. But I think it, when it comes down to it, they, we have some high, higher profile preseason tournaments that that get a lot of hype with just the amount of teams that are in one one area and one um, one tournament. But um, they just need some there, and then they're only like other prolific game or win, I should say, it was against then number 18, Nebraska, winning that game um, first weekend of the season. So their season hasn't been that strong. I think they're still getting the love in the rankings just with how well they've done. I mean, especially this weekend going 3-0 against against Syracuse. I think they outscored Syracuse 16-0. to zero. They did not allow Syracuse to score one run. So if the other school does not work, then odds are you win. So um, – I uh, I know that they're they're doing amazing, but I just think for the shine to come through, if you're or the hype, I think it just is going to happen with more, uh, with better competition, um, which we will continue to see throughout the ACC season. They play Florida State, Clemson, um, UNC, Virginia Tech. They have a tough ACC schedule, so I think we will start to see that a lot, and and they have a big opportunity to keep proving themselves. But up until this point, there just hasn't been um, a lot of strength in their schedule. Yeah, I mean, this because of the competition they have in their conference, that is a big opportunity for them. And I think we're just going to hear more and more about them. I feel like that happened last year, too. And then we go into the postseason, right? And they're a top eight seed. So yeah. I think it, visibility is everything, though. Like you said, I mean, some of these big time preseason tournaments, obviously, a lot of eyeballs are on them. And I will say, I do think it's, you know, our job to pay attention to all of what's going on, not just the games that are the easiest to watch, let's say. But at the same time, visibility is always going to help just in terms of awareness. And I think not only with the conference play competition level, but also the fact that it's, you know, ACC network and very accessible is also going to get them even more attention. Yes. All right. The big one. We touched on it a little bit, but we're going to dive even deeper now. Has Texas earned the number one spot? This question came up. It was a general theme as well. Just what people think. So I have some like stats and things that I can nerd out about in a second, Amanda, but I know you touched on this already. Yeah. I think that, um, doing rankings, especially this early in the season, no one has really earned anything, right? Like, especially when there hasn't been a head to head, Texas and Oklahoma haven't gotten at it yet. So there really has, no one's earned anything there. No championship has been earned. So no, like no one has earned the number one spot honestly. And I mean, I think before OU has just with how long they have their winning win streak and just um, the proof of all those veteran players. But now when you look at it just side by side, like I touched on before, the, the loss, they both have one loss and Texas's loss is just a better loss when it comes to strength of schedule and, and RPI and things like that. But um, they lost in eight innings to a very, very tough Stanford team with with an incredible pitching staff and, and obviously they're highly ranked in our rankings. And then, Oh, you lose to unranked ULL who um, is 10 and 12 on the season. So down to when you compare both of those teams, because both of them, you could honestly say are tied for number one at this point without a, without a head to head. Um, but I, I would have put, I do not submit a ranking, um, but I would have put Texas probably at my number one, just when we're comparing um, up to date of what their, both their seasons has looked like. And OU's not playing very clean softball right now, which I think we're very, we're not used to seeing that. We're not used to seeing the errors and, and kind of, we're used to seeing them do all the things that they're supposed to do. They always look extremely professional, extreme, extremely clean on defense. And while they still were getting some clutch hits, we saw many errors this weekend that we are not used to them seeing. Um, and so that could be another reason why they slipped to number two rather than staying at number one, even after the loss. Mm, yes. And I, I think that, you know, Patty Gasso talks about this all the time, that everything's a learning opportunity for them. So by no means is this one blip this early in the season, like the defining characteristic of them for 2024. I think we all know that by now. Uh, and she said it, she's like, you know, we, we're not going to mope around about it. We're not built that way. Like we're built to 
to take this and and really run with it in a positive direction. And I, I still say the same thing too. Yes, like there are arguments for both. I can see absolutely either side. Um, for OU fans, it's like, yeah, it was only one loss. Like it was a 71 game win streak, the longest we've ever seen. Look what happened last year when they had one loss, right? I mean, what what do they have to do? Literally be perfect. But also, you know, they weren't throwing their number one or number two pitcher at the end when they did actually lose the game, the law, the losing pitcher of the game. They were throwing their number three in terms of innings pitched. Mm -hmm. And if you do look at RPI, which just dropped, like we said, OU is number five, Texas is number seven. So I could see Sooner fans like throwing that into the mix. And then even some key stats. You're right, Amanda. Like they didn't look as sharp defensively, which we're not used to seeing because they led the nation in fielding percentage last year. They mm -hmm. still, even with what they did recently, are top three in the nation with a 986 as a team. Texas is not in the top 50, just to give that kind of context. And then OU, they haven't been leaving the yard as much, but they still are number four in the nation in terms of home runs per game. Texas is number eight. So I'm looking at that piece <laughs> as, okay, these are some of the arguments. It's by no means exhaustive, but some of the arguments for OU. But if you look at the other side, for Texas, you might think for the Longhorn fans, like, well, let's look at this season. These rankings for this season are at this specific point in time. And I think the biggest argument is one of the ones that you already said, Amanda, which is that they both only have one loss and just the quality of the losses are different. They also both beat the teams that they lost to. So Texas did beat Stanford as well. OU did beat Louisiana as well, but the Texas win is a quote unquote stronger win mm -hmm. over Stanford than the other way around. Um, and I would say Texas also beat Louisiana twice. So just kind of keeping that in mind, since we don't have head to head to your point, Texas has played seven games against teams who were ranked at that time. OU has only played three. Texas is also ahead of OU as a team in a few big categories. They're number two in the nation in terms of batting average hitting four or nine. They are number three in terms of runs per game over nine runs per game. They're averaging and they're under one as an ERA staff. So that's Texas. OU is still doing well, but slightly below Texas. You know, they're number four in batting average across the country. They're number five in terms of runs per game. And they have a 1.39 staff ERA, which puts them at number six. So there's merit to both. You know, if you want to dig in all the different directions, I've seen both play in person. It, this was already a series, I think, Amanda, that we talked about that we were looking forward to the most anyway in Big 12, just before all these rankings things happened this week like those two just looked fantastic and we were very excited to watch them play and then the last thing i'll say too is like don't forget the same thing happened last year <laughs> ou mm -hmm. lost to baylor early they dropped from number one for about five seconds that was in all the major polls too ours the coaches poll espns etc then they returned with a vengeance and never looked back for over a year you know, and the coaches poll did come out this week too. OU, OU is still number one, but it's not unanimous. Texas also got some votes. LSU even got some votes as the only undefeated team at the point in time when everybody voted. So, you know, it's barely March. I think we just got to let it play out. And now my my rant is over. <laughs> oh, I love it. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, man. But... Um, this was the theme too, right? Like we said, has Texas earned the number one spot? It's like Oklahoma only loses one game and drops out of the top spot, right? So that's why we're saying there really are two sides of the coin mm -hmm. and there's a lot more softball to be played. Whew, man. But there was obviously some super exciting softball played this past weekend too. And we're super excited about our guests today. And let's just head right into the interview. Joining us today is two-time Sunbelt Coach of the Year, four-time Sunbelt regular season and tournament champion, the head coach at Louisiana, Jerry Glasgow. And I know, Coach, you already know my co-host, Amanda Lorenz. Everybody knows Amanda that likes hitters. And a hitter is hitter. <laughs> so, yeah, I've known him. I've watched Amanda play since she was like 14, 15 years old and have so many good memories. And then I was fortunate enough to get a coacher uh, with the USSA Pride and a uh, coach's dream to coach someone like Amanda. A bit. <laughs> That's, That's enough. You can't on her too much. You know, you get her big headed over there. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So literally, in, in my opinion, like 
one of the two or three. I don't want to. There's so many great players. I don't want to slide anybody, but Amanda, if you ask me to name three great hitters, she's in that list and and just so special. Thanks, Coach Glasgow. We're so excited that you're on with us and we can't wait to talk talk about your team. Yeah, yeah I love to talk softball and, and I love the sport and I'm I, I just I love talking about it. So let's go. Cool. Same. Us too. <laughs> us too. I mean, we'll start with the the obvious thing right now that's the talk of the town, which is you ending Oklahoma's historic 71 game win streak in Oklahoma too, at Love's Field, at their new stadium. I just think I'm very impressed, I would say, from the mentality side of things, like just seeing the way that your team handled the pressure. And one of the biggest things that I was impressed by is once, you know, you had the lead, not only that you got the lead initially, but once they came back and tied it, then you got it again. That is what's been really hard for a lot of people to do against Oklahoma. They seem to figure it out at the end some way, somehow, but you guys did it. And talk to me about that mental toughness. Yeah, I, I was just so proud of my kids. Like, that's why I told my coach, uh, I was talking to my pitching coach, Justin Rubel Show, uh, a couple of hours ago, you know. And I think that, you know, beating Oklahoma is great. You know, we you're very fortunate. The game, if you're around the game long enough, a long enough time period, the game will allow you to have moments of success and then you're going to have a lot of moments of failure and people tend to forget most of those except you don't if you're a winner. And and then, the, you know, you just get in those spots. But I was just so happy for my kids and so proud of my kids and the players for the way they responded because I was telling Coach Robichaud, you know, like a lot of teams will get a good team on the ropes and Oklahoma's not just a good team. They're a great team, and they're a great coach team, a uh, phenomenal coach team. Um, but then you see them, you know, they always – you lose the lead in the seventh inning. And I don't know how many times when I coached at Georgia, you know, you would play a midweek game, and you'd be down by one in the seventh, or you'd be down by two in the seventh, and the other team thought you had you, and you knew you were going to come back and beat them. You just knew that, and you do that. And if you – but – and if you got them tied up, and the momentum's to you. And and so I think that was the biggest shock of the game was like when Oklahoma tied it, and I, I was telling our kids, like, this isn't over, guys. They're coming. They're gonna come and they're gonna they're gonna throw blows. When you 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 know, you throw a blow, they throw a blow. And during the game I'm illustrating, you know, like, hey, you just give them a black eye, they're gonna bloody your nose right now. And you better get ready to knock their tooth out. <laughs> and you know, you want your team to you look at it like it's a it's a fight. And very seldom do you see a team can can overcome that emotions that you have when you let that two run lead slip away in the bottom of the seventh and then get back up in the eighth. And not only that, you know, we lost the two run lead, but then we lost our fiery leader jumping into the wall and you know, she's laying on the ground and I mean I just want to throw up. I mean, I watched the video of, of her catch like thirty times today trying to figure out how she hurt her knee and what happened and how, you know, how serious I think it could be from looking at the film. And I'm looking at myself, like I'm showing no emotion. I'm like, just kind of like a zombie walking up to her. But I literally was like about to throw up <laughs> and it took me 30 seconds to realize like she's the lead off hitter here in the eighth inning. And so then it, another 10 seconds to process, <clears throat> you know, who to pinch hit for her and, I wanted to hit pinch hit Lecker and Lecker was in the bullpen warming up. So she had to come running up on the spur of the moment, which might've been good because it might not have allowed her to think about the moment in my opinion, but it was just, it was just huge the way they, they responded. And then, you know, I've been around the game forever. So I know the one thing when you play a good team and we did the same thing to Texas last Sunday is like I have to be aggressive with my calls and I have to be aggressive with the hit and run and I have to get, be aggressive with the uh, bunt and run and I'm going to be aggressive to uh, a crazy extent because your players have to know you're not intimidated. And it's tricky in this game because Rosha is such a great pitch caller for Oklahoma. She's an amazing softball mind. And then I played so many games against her against Florida. So I'm like, I'm going to pinch her. I'm going to hit and run here. It's 2 0. Oh, I can't. Roach is over. She'll pitch out on 2 0 because she knows Jerry Glasgow is going to 
<laughs> and so I would like be given a signal for like 10 seconds to try to make her think I'm what got something on and she pitched out and, and she caught me on uh, Sam Roa. When Sam Roa was up, I thought she didn't, there's no way she thinks I'm going to be nervy enough to hit and run right here with Sam Roa up. And she caught that. And I mean, she called it and I got to, like, I guess she doesn't have much respect. She thinks I'm an idiot, but she, she called the, she called the pitch out and had, and luckily they threw the ball away, but we applied pressure. And if you look at the game, like, where, where ground ball go, where GB go from third. And it just eventually, the, I think the pressure did kind of, you know, when you look at Oklahoma, as great as they are, they don't get many opportunities to practice that. I'm sure they practice in practice, but in actual game footage, I'm sure like Patty Gasso today is probably celebrating. That's going to win her a game somewhere down the way because next time they won't be rattled like that. Um, and so it was fun. And so, I love it. Um, so you've had a really tough preseason schedule and, you know, probably a little, a little of a rough start in, in your mind, just as the record shows. But so how, when, especially going two, going, going two and three, but what, what do you tell your team after that Liberty loss to get them ready to go to make them really feel like they are able to beat Oklahoma? Because I feel like that's been half the battle with all of these programs. Oklahoma has built this mountain that they just seem like they're kind of untouchable when they're really just a softball team playing the same game, but you get those athletes to really believe that they can be the ones to take, to take a game from them. Yeah. You know, I, this season has been tricky because I scheduled to schedule. I want to get tougher. Like we, we play in a, a good conference the Sun Belt, but we need the wars. Like uh, the one thing I miss bad from the SEC is the wars that toughen you up as you go through the season. And, you know, you got Florida this weekend and next week, you know, you you go 0-3 and, and then you look at the schedule and you've got Alabama and then you go, you know, 1-2 and two or 0-3 and three there and you look up and you got number five Auburn back in the Clint Meyer days and – and it and I miss that. And then you then you get look, you got Tennessee with the weeklies, and then you got it just goes on and on, right? And so your team though, and you look at the schedule before the season, you're like, oh man, we may not win two or three games. We could go, we could go 0 and 18. We could go two and eighteen if we get things going wrong. And and then you get at the end of it and you look you're seven and nine or you're nine and seven, and you survive it somehow always. And when you survive it always. You go into the postseason, and man, you got a hard team. Like you know what it feels like when you're on that team that is, is, is mentally tough. It's a different feeling. And so my first few years here, I didn't understand that. And and then I, I, I you know, physically or mentally, I could figure out like what we had to do. And so I scheduled to schedule last year, and I scheduled to schedule this year. And if you look at it, like it, it looks like you're crazy, but um, I know that it. I, I know that you've got to have that. You've got to be tested and you've got to learn how to handle the pressure. And I thought that's one thing they did really good at Texas last week. And they did it good again yesterday. They handled the pressure well. And then, you know, I told my wife this morning and when I left the house, like she said, Jerry, you, you, you need to be happy. And I said, I'm not happy at all. You know? And she said, well, everybody's celebrating. And I said, everybody's celebrating except me. Because I'm so disappointed in the coaching job I've done, um, and so and that was my message when we lost to Liberty yesterday morning. You know, I called the team out in the outfield because I knew that they couldn't feel bad about themselves, or, or they would miss the opportunity to compete with Oklahoma. And so I called them all out in the outfield grass, and I said, "Look, you know, we <laughs> we just gotten demolished." And I said, "Look, you know, I, I need you guys to look at me in the eye and." and look at me and and i looked at each one of them in the circle and i was like, i don't blame any of you i only blame me like i blame me for that loss and i blame me for the miami loss and i don't blame any of you because it's my responsibility as a coach to have you ready for these games and and i failed and i failed miserably uh so all i want you to do now is go out here in this game and just play as hard as you can play and give me everything you got and and I'll go to work. We're, we'd we'd already told the team that after this tough stretch, they had Monday and Tuesday off, and I was going to go to Florida. Um, and I said, you know, give me 
give me 48 hours, I promise. I'll, I'll go to work and I'll figure it out and I'll make the adjustments and we'll be ready for the Sun Belt. Just, just stick with me right here today and forget everything has happened and play your best and play your hardest because you can, you can compete with Oklahoma. You can win the game if you do that. And um, I, I was desperate, you know, as a coach. Like, <laughs> that's not how you want to go into an Oklahoma game with a performance like we had at Liberty. Um, and I meant every word of it. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I was dying to, to get beat like that by a team we beat yesterday, you know, and I, I wasn't happy when we won that game. I think it was one to nothing, one to, one to nothing against Liberty. And my hitters didn't, you know, do the things that I expect us to do. Anyway, that, that was not the way you would ideally on paper write up that game. But I think when you look back on it with hindsight, maybe the girls were, um, they, they, you know, there's nothing after you lose. You, like in travel ball, the best thing about travel ball, you lose a game on Saturday morning, you go to lose the bracket, you can play five more games Saturday. And you, you love that when you're 14, 15, 16 years old. And you love that opportunity to get back out there quick. And I think that maybe it was, it set us up in a better way than what we realized at the time. But it, uh, me as a coach, like, this is a tricky uh, stretch for me. And I don't want to miss it. I, I mean, we've lost 12 games the last year, two years, I think, 12 and 13 games. And we've already got 12 losses or, yeah, 12 losses already. I'm dying <laughs> as a coach. And I feel anything but successful. And the Oklahoma game, is it doesn't even – I know what happened in the Oklahoma game. I know exactly what happened. And I know, I know the breaks we got. I know the, the things that we did well. I know exactly what happened. I know how we won the game. And what I can't figure out is how we're losing the game, like to, the game to Liberty or the the loss to Miami. I don't know how we lost those games. I'm not got it in my mind. So that's where my mind's at a hundred thousand percent right now. It, tricky as that is to understand, but that's honest. Well, I think it's always helpful to hear the hard, right? Like it's one thing to see certain results. It's another thing to hear about the journey to get there. Like if you look at the program, we're looking at Louisiana, it's 24 straight seasons going to the NCAA tournament and 40 plus wins. You have four consecutive conference championships in your tenure. And this year it's, it's the drive to five. So that sort of looks like consistency. We're talking about Oklahoma's win streak, but that's a lot of consistency as well within your program. But there's a lot of tough things along the way. So what are the keys to being able to have that kind of sustained success? Uh, consistency. You know, we've, got, we've also got how many conference series in a row? 80? 81 maybe? 81 straight conference series wins. That's, that's so hard to do. And so consistency comes from consistent performance, obviously, but consistent performance where you show up on defense, offense, base running, <clears throat> and pitching. You know, there's people talk about the three areas, defense, pitching, and offense, but the base running is in there too. And uh, we that's not what we've been. We've just not been consistent. So that drives a coach like me crazy. Like, I mean, it really is hard on me um, personally. <laughs> and I, I'm like, I'm just so, um, I don't want to say, embarrassed is for ego. You know, I'm not embarrassed. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm so um, confused by why, and, and I'm and I'm also intrigued by why. You know, like that's what I think we'll figure it out because I'm fascinated by why. Like I'm that's all I'm worried about is why. Um, and so, but that's the key to consistency, and that's the key to getting our season back. I, you know, I did things different this year too, and so. I, um, I I hired a, uh, the fourth coach, allowed me to hire a specialist on the defensive side, and I hired a specialist on the offensive side. And I turned the hitting over uh, to Shelly Landry, who's I just love Shelly. Like, she was working so hard, and she's a young um, female that's played the sport, All-American here at town, hometown girl. And, and you know, uh, I really have stepped back. Like, I didn't, I didn't want to be that coach that I put her in charge of hitting, and I'm over – her shoulder every day and I stepped back really far and then in January my dad's 93 and I had him living at the house we did a knee replacement surgery and and I spent 14 days you know really taking care of my dad which I do again in a second and that it and that really allowed 
my coaches to do a lot of work that maybe I should have been doing. And and so that I take responsibility for that too. Like, I think that all plays into a little bit of this slow start. Um, and so now we got to make all these adjustments and, and, and we're ready to, we're, we're ready to, we, we all want to win. We're all committed. The coaching staff is a hundred percent together and a hundred percent wanting to make those moves that we know because we know we had a pretty good team and we knew like in October I kept watching this team and this could be the best team I had besides the 2020 team and it might be as good as the 2020 team when the season ends so everything's still there the pieces are all exactly there it's just it's a journey and that's the there's a lot more to a softball team uh and a program than what meets the eye if you just watch the games love it just talk a little bit about your potential as a team this year, just with obviously you've seen little glimpses of it throughout the preseason, but what excites you the most about this 2024 team? Yeah, enormous potential. If we put it all together, you look at this point, like we're not pitching well, we're not hitting well, we're not fielding well. And the whole fall was based on changing our defense, changing. I, we had 13 double plays in 2022, and we had 12 double plays in 2023. We went down 15, 13, 12. I, 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 I know I want that defense to be different. And so I brought in um, Hunter Beach because he had been with Clint Myers, who I admired his defense at Auburn. I thought Clint Myers' defense – was just absolutely amazing to watch what he did when I was at, at Georgia and the A and M, and so Hunter knows all that. Like he's he's got it all down. Like he, you know, I'm adding to this is my words, but I think you can see a clear admiration, almost instead of idolization, of of Clint Myers and their system. And so I brought him in here, and he's he's it's it's amazing to hear him talk and 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 uh, instill the system in our girls and. You know, we've turned 15 double plays. It's a 22 uh, game. We've turned 15 double plays. So that's done. I mean, we, we were on pace to turn like 40, a team that turned 12 and 13. And so, but the pieces aren't together yet. And we're way better on getting the ball off the wall, bringing in a ball like on, uh, with a runner on second. We're not going to give up the middle and we're not going to allow the batter just to float into second base because we're looking at that runner going to home. We make better judgment. We're better on the doubles and triples in the corners. We make much better relay throws. All that stuff is there. It's just not It's not peaked yet. Like, it's going to come together. Um, offensively, we're hitting 268 or, uh, as a team. This time last year, we were hitting 303. Uh, we've scored 30 less runs. It, and we're, we're going to be okay. You know, we've got the pieces there. We're not striking out much. We're, we're walking. We're getting hit more. We've got 18 hit by pitches versus 10 a year ago. Um, we've got a lot more doubles. We we have less home runs, but we got a lot more doubles. So the pieces are there, and it's going to come together offensively. The game has changed because of video review. Um, so we're having to change the way we're we're playing the game, and I'm kind of learning on the go because I knew early on when I read the rule that you could review the lead, I said stolen base in the SEC will go down 50%. The first day I read that rule, I said that. Stolen base and SEC will go down 50%. Maya Davis' stolen base numbers will go down 50%. I may have missed that. I, it may go down two-thirds. I'm anxious to see the SEC play out. Um, and, and then how do we attack that uh, strategy? Like I've even thought about that. Just get, just make them challenge two stolen bases, leaving early early in the game, uh, and run, run them out of – and that way I can run like we used to. At this time last year, we had like 47 stolen bases, and we've got like 15 or 12. I don't know. It's way down. Um, and so then it took me a little while to figure out, okay, the hit and run and the, the things that we've always done, hit and run, bunt and run, slap and run, we can do that even better now. Like we have to use that more now. And so I'm trying to reinvent how I coach to fit the, the current rule system, as is Patty Gasso, as is Tim Walton, as is – every great coach um um so there's that's some changes that are going on and once we figure that out i think we'll see improvement there and then you know we're 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 we lost megan shorman and we lost kendra lamb two really good pitchers so 
we've got this Chloe Riasetto who you saw yesterday beat Oklahoma, and I'm so excited about her. I've said, uh, Amanda, she reminds me of Gurley a lot, and she doesn't have the real slow off speed, but she's uh, a, a carbon copy almost of Gurley, who was a phenomenal pitcher at Florida. Am, am I saying that name right? Hey, Gurley. Yeah. I mean, I just had so much admiration for because she was kind of like Hannah Rogers, same way. Like they made their living and with two things uh, hitting exactly the spot that Rocha told them to throw it to. <laughs> and and also just, you know, being able to pinpoint control and then back the ball up six miles an hour or 12, 13 mile an hour. And uh, I see so much potential in Chloe to do that. And then Sam Landry's a more mature player this year as well. Hmm. You know, Coach, I actually played regionals my senior year at Lamson Park. This is before – I'm not going to age myself, but this is before you were were there. Uh, but it was it was a really cool atmosphere. It was not long after some of the million-dollar renovations. People were tailgating the softball games, which I thought was awesome. Can you describe and characterize the type of support you have from the fan base there? Uh, it's amazing. It's a it's a really amazing environment. We have we have great fans. They're very passionate. They know the sport. Like I think the unique thing about our fans is um, they're not family of the kids. They're just older people. It's family of the program, and they, our fans become family to the program, but not necessarily. You know, the kids are. We have a few parents here. We have the normal, but we have a, a group of senior citizen age people that are. Um, very passionate about softball. So like this, they're like, um, they're very respectful in how they approach opponents. And, you know, they're going to cook for you. They're going to feed for you. They're going to buy you a beer on the way to the car, uh, give you a beer out of cooler as you walk to your car and go by their tailgating spot. They're amazing, friendly people. Uh, uh, so it's, a, I'm very lucky to be, if you're in a mid major, it's, it's, it's uh, just a tremendous honor to be in this environment that they provide for us. Yeah, I, I remember playing there during my time and and I thought they were absolutely ruthless and, and yelling and just, you know, so crazy. And I this was young. I was younger as well. And I remember we were walking out and they were like, hey, you guys want some food? Like it, the, the second that the, the series was over, they were just the nicest people offering us some some really good Louisiana food so um we were like oh my gosh like and we took it we took food it was yummy um same it, same experience <laughs> it was so funny that i remember like and i we played in the sec like we had some crazy fan bases but then playing at playing at ull those those fans were different you know louisiana is just a different type of crazy yeah it's loud and you know <laughs> they do uh lou harris talks about when she was at nichols uh lou harris chamber talks about they would throw a rubber chicken out and and reel it in with a fishing pole out in the field. And, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, Nor um, Illinois State, they still have one of those rubber chickens that they used to throw out hung in their team dugout uh, because they their center fielder caught it and tore it off the fishing line, and they, they took it home as a trophy. But there's just a lot of tradition, and Yvette Gerard can tell so many stories about the olden days and how it all started. But it, it is a really neat, historic program and you know it, it's, it's important for us like the 40 game streak to, to the 40 win streak uh to keep it going i didn't know my first year i didn't even know there was a 40 win streak i didn't know anything you know i just come in in january and we start coaching and uh you know we go to our first conference series was at uh, ut arlington and we lose the friday night game they go hey got 36 uh, conference win streaks or, uh win series in a row you know, you got to win the next two games of that 36 game streak or 37, maybe. But I, I just, I like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I, oh, and then we won the game. We won game three in 12 innings on Sunday. Casey Dixon, a, a freshman, I gave her the ball in like the sixth inning, and we, we finally went like three to two. And we made it through that. And, and, and so I was like, that streak, I felt so like I never felt like I was a part of it at all. I just felt like it was a huge burden to try to keep it going for the fans. And, and I kept telling the kids like, Hey, this was, this is like 300 kids that's played in this streak. We owe it to them to give everything we got to keep a conference win streak going. And, not, and never, ever did I think of it. I wasn't proud of it for me at all. And this, 
like I felt like a burden to keep it going for those athletes that started in in 2013, who I didn't even know. Uh, and so now when it gets up to 80, like I think at some point last year, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a part of this now, you know. But um, And then at the regional, my first year in 2018, we go to LSU and we get beat the first game and, and we uh, come back and we beat Fordham, I believe it was, and then we beat Houston. And the radio announcer comes down and says, Coach, I didn't dream that we'd win 40 this year. I thought that streak was over, but we we tied that 40-game win streak. And, and I, I'd gotten to know the radio announcer really well over the season. I said, why didn't you tell me that? And he goes, Coach, I've seen how hard you're working all year. I didn't want to put one more burden on you. Uh, and we literally won 41 games that year, barely kept it alive. And uh, – <laughs> So it, and it's going to be a challenge this year. To, that's a streak that's in jeopardy if you look at the schedule right now. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a um, push to get there, and we better eat our weedies and get things going. No, no doubt that you will. I think when I look back to like my time playing for you, I know that you were with us just such like immediately when you came in. You just we all loved you right away because you loved us right away, and I know that your kids feel that all the time, and by far the craziest things. Like I've never played for a coach like you of like game on the line, three, two squeeze, let's do it. Two outs, let's do it. Like just like crazy things that I've never like thought like defy all odds of softball. But if this guy who loves us and believes in us so much is telling us to do it, like, yeah, we're going to do it. So just talk about like where that aggressiveness came from and what you think that does for your teams. It, it, it's really easy, first of all, when you're coaching Sidney Romero and Amanda Lorenz and, you know, Kelly Kretzman. And I remember the first year I got to coach the Pride, you know, we had Natasha Watley, Caitlin Lowell, Kelly Kretzman, Kat Osterman. I remember we won the championship and my wife said, like, Jerry, you're not excited? I said, well, I'm excited about the bonus, but. Let's be honest, Vicky. My mom could have coached Surprise and they were in the championship. They had cut off. And then 2017, I had Monica Abbott. Like, and, you know, we won. I, you know, we, we, we had Amanda. I mean, um, we had Monica Abbott. And, but then that 2019 team, when everybody got hurt, we lost our whole infield. Um, injury after Sierra right before season, I sent her home when she was going to be thrown out by 15 feet by Czechoslovakia or somebody in a practice game, like so stupid and tore ACL. And I felt so bad about it. I still feel bad about it. And then everybody got hurt <laughs> and we just started trading like Don trade me for this girl. I want, you know, um, we wanted uh, Carazoni and we, I wanted, I uh, really wanted Cervantes really bad because I had her in 2019 um, or 2017 with the Scrapyard Dogs, and Cervantes is on a whole nother level picking pitches in the dugout and her maturity of the game. Um, and we lost Jess. I mean, we lost everybody on the infield. We, then we lost our catcher, uh, uh, batting 400 in the four hole. Anyway, when we won that championship, I'm like, Vicky. Coaching might have helped win this one. I, I can take I, – I, I, I was a special team to me because I felt like I got to do something. You know, like I didn't get any hits, but I got. I felt like I helped us win that. Whereas, you know, in the others, I just felt like I was lucky enough to tag along and get a carry the bats for the great players. So, anyway, th th get back to what we're talking about. And this is where, like, as I get older, like, I worry. Like, there's always a time every coaching has an end. And you're, you know, every coach has a, um, what do you call it, shelf life, that you can be a successful coach. And I, I started out in travel ball. Like nobody's given me anything. I started out travel ball and uh, with a team out of Illinois called Southern Force. And, you know, I started that team. And I, I saw my first gold game in 2000, uh, 1999, 2000. And uh, I remember I asked the, Carrie Blake, like the coach of Southern Illinois, who's the best pitcher here? I want to watch her. And she said, well, go see uh, Kat Osterman and Alicia Hollowell. And uh, Kat was a junior in high school, and Alicia Hollowell was just getting ready to go into Arizona, and I went and watched those games. So that's how, you know, and I saw Kat Osterman on a Tuesday afternoon struck out 
20 batters. This is 40 feet, St. Louis, Missouri, ASA Gold Nationals. And there had a piece of paper all the coaches would sign, and it was 364. I won't never forget it. 364 assistant and head coaches signed that paper across like 20-foot banner. And I mean, I mean, I'm a just a dad, right? Like I'm a, a crazy dad. I'm not even a coach. And and I'm watching this like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I saw Cat Osborne pitch. And I on Tuesday afternoon, and I her dad had on a, a line I had, Illinois. I, I went to University of Illinois. And I walk up and I said, University of Illinois, yeah, you know, class or whatever. So I think it was seventy four. Um, and I said. Uh, yeah, I'm just watching. They said this pitcher is like the best pitcher in the country. And he says, well, that's my daughter. So we hit it off good, Gary uh, Osterman. And this was in 1999. So they they win. She strikes out 20. So we lose on Wednesday. We go out. My daughter's playing with a team called St. Louis Heat. They just picked her up. My oldest daughter is now the coach at Eastern Illinois University. And so we lose on Wednesday. And I tell my wife, we, we're not going home. We're, we're going to uh, – I want the girls to see this kid pitch, this left-handed pitcher pitch, uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. And my wife's like, Jerry, we've been at the ballpark all summer long because Tara had played. She was playing eight teams. And then my middle daughter, Erin, that played at Texas A&M, was playing like 13-year-old. You know, none of them had ever played ASA before. They'd always just played like high school, played high school, and in-town little league teams played. And I said, I want, I want Tara and Aaron to see this picture. If you, and I said, if you could watch Michael Jordan play basketball when he was a sophomore in high school, you would stay and watch him play basketball. And that's what this this girl's good. Like I'm, I don't know why I'm, uh, I'm just actually right? <laughs> Ken Osper is going to be like Michael Jordan. But I'm pretty <laughs> accurate. And uh, so I said, look, you know, take the kids to the mall, do whatever you want. I'll have the lawn chairs. I'll have his front row seats. And we're going to watch Cat Osmond at 6 o'clock. Now, mm-hmm. get this. Jess Allister is a catcher. How's that? <laughs> How's cool is that? And so, uh, Jerry Ann is a baby. Jerry Ann is, uh, I, I think, one year old or two years old. Let's see. That's not right. She was born in 94. So, she'd have been four or five years old. And so, but I got our five lawn chairs right against the fence. And when I saw her on Tuesday afternoon, there was maybe three coaches there. So Thursday night, we're you know we're in the we're getting a little deeper in the tournament. Literally, at five o'clock, every college coach in America starts coming. You know UCLA, Arizona. You know Mike Candrea, they're all there. And here's Jerry Glasgow, the nerd from Southern Illinois. Got my five little lawn chairs right up against the fence at four o'clock for the six o'clock game. So my kids and my family, we're all in the front row in front of all these really good college coaches. You're probably saying. Who's the idiot with those three kids up there taking up the good seat? And we're wanting to watch this. Anyway, we we watched Cat Osterman. She struck out 18 that night. They won two to one. Ithia McMichaels hit a home run to right center field. And uh, they won two to one. And Cat struck out 18, 40 feet. And uh, so that was like a miracle, right? Like I watched that and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to start a gold team next summer because these kids get to go to college and you know, I wanted to help like the local kids when my daughter's age was eighth grade. And uh, so I started a, a gold team in 2001. And in 2003, we won the Canada Cup. And in 2004, we won the ASA Gold Nationals. And uh, this, this like divine intervention, right? Like it could it couldn't have happened by accident. It had to have I had to have help, especially if you know me. And and uh, so when we won in 2004, like, you know, we're we're playing against Amanda Scarborough and Megan Gibson. Angelica Selden was the top pitcher mm-hmm. that year, that summer. Truman Cowles played Arizona State. And so then, so that's 2004, five years later. Ten years later, I'm catch, coaching Cat Osterman on the Pride. Now, how cool is that, right? Like, my journey through softball, is, uh, it's just been a huge blessing. And, and I'm just so lucky. But I worry. Back to your original question 20 minutes ago, I worry about my shelf life. You know, like, how long can I motivate kids? How long do kids want to have this over her guy in the dugout with us? And, and you know, that's the, that's the thing that, that's interesting to me. And, and I want to I wanna go out while I, I don't want to go too – I don't want to stay too long. <laughs> so, uh, yesterday was a good win in that sense, like that 
I was really proud of my uh, players for responding because I put them in a really the schedule's tough and for them to answer with that win that was the part I took out of it like you know maybe my shelf life maybe I'm not old lettuce it's just about got to be thrown out yeah I got maybe I got a game or two left this is the coolest thing ever getting to hear you chat. I mean, the fact that you have coached at all these different levels, travel ball, high school, college, you coached Amanda and many others in pro. Like, I feel like I am going to walk away from this conversation with more coaching insight, some softball history, and just a warm heart because of yeah. how much your love of the game clearly exudes for me. Uh, you're, you're just the best. My my cheeks hurt from smiling so much. Yeah. So. So great to hear you and your passion for the game and your passion for all the players that you've coached and your love just exudes for our sport and our sport is so much better because you're in it. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Excited that all of our listeners are going to get a little glimpse of, of you and, and your love for our sport because, gosh, I know this will brighten their day. Yeah, very, uh, very good. To, the sport's been very good to me and yesterday was like a... a a re one of those really good moments, you know, when you, when things go right, because a lot of times they don't go right and you work hard, you work hard, you work hard and things just don't go right. And every once in a while, you know, things do go right. And we were very fortunate in that game. And, you know, Patty, Coach Gasso, I just have so much respect for her. I want to say this, I, I we talked the whole time, but I don't want to leave this interview without saying this. That stadium is so good for our sport. It, it, I, I said all week, it's an amphitheater. It's built down in the ground. It's like being in an amphitheater, but for softball. Mm -hmm. And it, our sport needed that so much. It, it's like, so it sounds like surround sound, you know, the fans that coming from every direction. And um, it was just an incredible testimony to what she did. And, you know, when we went in the older hitting facility, you know, I'm watching, like, you think about all the great hitters. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, Lauren Chamberlain and Aloe and Pinley and all these great hitters. And they, they trained in that little old hitting cage. Just the whole mix this weekend was so good. And, and Coach Gasso, mm -hmm. what she did is like such an amazing, just amazing coach. And, you know, like you watch the game. If you know the game, like I know the game or you all know the game, like she wasn't making ever move. Like it was a World Series moment for, for us. And, but for her, it was a teaching moment, and she just playing it out, let whatever happened happen. Um, and I, she just so classy. And after the game, she's so nice and so gracious. And it was a it was a huge uh, thrill to play in that stadium. And that the fans, the stadium's unbelievable. But then the fan base that she had ready that follows her program because of their great success. That just you already got the people in the seats. Mm -hmm. Everybody should go to Oklahoma and play with their team because it's it's special. It's really really special. So cool. Yeah. Well, what you're doing is special too, coach. Thank you again for joining us. We are so excited to have had you and uh, we're excited to watch you the rest of the way this season. Right. Thank you all. Man, it, it was the best talking with coach Glasgow. I mean, I just love seeing your reunion with him too, Amanda, to be yeah. honest. Um, he's so great and he just, he loves so hard and it's just so fun to hear him and his passion come through, even just talking with him, um, on this, but, uh, he, he loves, he loves our game so much and, and boy, does it shine through and super excited for him. A guy that works so hard and loves this game to get a huge win like that. And then totally on brand to be like, he was still so very concerned, um, Really soak soak up as good as that win was because he just doesn't love where his team is at um, at this point in the season. Yeah, yeah, and I I actually dug a little bit into the data too, thanks to our friends at six four three charts, just to see like, well, what was the win probability like going into it? So just to give some of that context too, there was a thirty one percent chance going into it that Louisiana would win going into the game, sixty nine percent chance for OU. And OU still held strong with their win probability late in the game, even when they were trailing slightly. So, you know, talk about define the odds. But like you said, Amanda, he knows that they have a lot more work to do and there's plenty of season yeah. left. Yep. All right. Well, I think it's time now for us to do the plays of the week. I 
I think we're both excited uh, about our choices uh, this week, Amanda. Should we just let them kind of speak for themselves first and then we'll add to it, I think. Yeah, so my play of the week is is getting that is ULL getting that final out against Oklahoma to secure that win. I think that um, a few teams have gotten a little bit close and have put some pressure on them late in games and have forced them to come back late and um, show what they're made of. And Louisiana was the first one to to get that out and and secure that win. So huge, huge win for them. And obviously, I know everybody was well aware uh, pretty much right after it happened of just, wow, ULL was the one to take them down after a 71 game win streak, their opening weekend at their brand new stadium in Love's Field. So just wild and so exciting for that program. Mm, Great choice. Amazing choice. I loved it. And my play of the week now Another pay off the goal. Off-speed crush, deep to right center. Walk us off, two-run homer. What a freaking adjustment by Ava Gall. She started off so anxious. She settles down and delivers once again. Ava Gall, the freshman, her and Nigel Kennedy, the stars of this one. I, I took a page out of your book, Amanda. I picked an offensive moment this week. I'm so proud. Thanks. I know. I'm, I'm trying to be more like you. Um, but, but yeah, you know, a walk-off home run by a freshman uh, to give, at the time, number seven, Stanford, the win over number four, Georgia, and extra innings. There's nothing quite like extra innings. But I think especially what you would have appreciated, Amanda, like the pitch to pitch adjustment leading up Mm -hmm. to the result of this at bat. She was so anxious. She completely was just like over swinging really fooled on the changeup early on. And then coach Alistair kind of called a timeout and I had a chance to ask Ava Gall afterwards. I'm like, what did she say to you? And she was like, she actually was like, Hey, I I don't have anything to tell you. I just, you know, want to give you some time to take a breath here (laughs) and, and relax a little bit. And she was like, Oh, okay. And so, and it helped, you know, because then she was sitting change and then, this is this is the result. And then they had some pretty sweet new rally glasses with the nerd glasses with the tape for Nerd Nation, which was a fun uh, addition. Oh, I love it. I love that insight about Coach Allister kind of knowing what her freshman needs in that moment. Um, so cool that sometimes, you know, coaches, they just know. I, I had a moment like that with Coach Walton early on in my career, too. He calls timeout. He's like, I, I can see your heart beating out of your chest from from the third base coaching box. So it's so cool. Like they just know how to how to calm us down. And um, so cool for that. Her like freshman to come out so big at home um, for her team and making those adjustments. And uh, wow. Goosebumps. So awesome. And it was her second home run of the game, by the way. I think I forgot to mention that. Like so she was responsible for all, all three runs, uh, for Stanford that came out of it, which was, which pretty awesome. Um, and also just, uh, the energy in the stadium. Like I was lucky to be in person, might've recognized, like I was calling the game. So my voice was definitely on there. Um, but just feeling that energy. And I know like you felt it when you've been like watching some games at Clemson to Amanda, like there's nothing quite like that in person feeling. Oh, no, it's so, it's so great. And just to like, really appreciate the fans and their involvement and just the passion. Um, it's, it's just so cool. I think that might be the perfect segue into our win and whiff of the week. Um, I'm up first. I'm going to let one of my, this do all the talking, but uh, just incredible to see Love's Field opening weekend in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, just wow, does that program deserve it? Um, Coach Gasso has done such an incredible job with with that program and, and what they've been able to do has been absolutely incredible. All of the athletes that have come through that program and just the winning tradition and talk about the fans as well. Like these fans are so passionate and have been selling out their Marita Hines field for so many years. And to, so to see them getting taken care of as well, to, to make sure that there are enough seats for all of those fans is, and I'm sure it's still not enough for, for how crazy <laughs> that fan base is, but just so cool to see everyone 
And I know I saw like a bunch of alums there as well, just so excited for their program and so proud because they absolutely deserve it. And it's just so exciting for our sport. And, and even Coach Glasgow said it um, in our interview with him, just how exciting it was for his team to go in there and play in this world-class, unbelievable stadium for our sport um, in college softball. And he said it was such a treat. And every single program, if they are able to schedule Oklahoma and go to Love's Field and play, they should absolutely take advantage of it because he said it was just an unbelievable experience. And I can't wait until I can go see a game in person there. But I'm so excited for them and Coach Gasso, all of their alums who have had a hand in making that possible, but just, just really cool. Really well said. The investment. So, so freaking cool. Yes. Awesome. On the other side, the whiff of the week. Well, the, the shortest game ever <laughs> played after one pitch, we're done from Conway, Arkansas. This issue in the pitching circle with that artificial turf. Uh, not able to repair it satisfactorily. And again, the, the big issue here is player safety. Right. Don't want pitchers getting injured. Louisiana Tech and Central Arkansas agreeing that they're going to reschedule this game. You know, it's interesting. The win and the win for the week are both have to do with facilities. But you know, you're, <laughs> who 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 would have thought we didn't we didn't plan that? But you know, Louisiana Tech at Central Arkansas, yeah, this, the shortest game probably of all time. Only one pitch was thrown. There was an issue with artificial turf, like they said on the broadcast. Um, what happened is I think the first pitch was a ball, but the turf in the pitching circle kind of peeled up and shifted out of place. So there was like a 10-minute delay, and then it was determined that it was unplayable. And I just think all, all of us players, right, like we feel like anytime you don't get to play, like that's a whiff. So here we are. Absolutely, absolutely a whiff. And so many times is um, turf is the hero um, when we have like a torrential downpour and you can so quickly get on the field and practice or play a game. And I feel like this is one of the very few instances that it's like, well, this is un. we can't come back from this as of right now. It's going to take a lot longer to repair instead of just throwing some dirt on it and and uh, fixing the problem. So super unfortunate. What a whiff. Yeah, man, rough. But I will say shout out to all the hardworking grounds crew all over the country because you really are the unsung heroes and there's so much that goes into it. So we still see you. We see you. <laughs> well, another another one in the books, Amanda. I mean, it's it's crazy like how far along we already are in the season. Um, but there's there's more to come. There's more Absolutely. to come. Absolutely. We're, we're starting conference um, play for the SEC this weekend. Um, really excited about that. I know the ACC started um, this past weekend. I was actually in the stands for NC State versus Clemson. Um, really exciting to see NC State, man. Coach Lindsay Leftwich, first year head coach, is is getting her kids ready to play. Man, they they were swinging hard and looked super fearless, and it's it's really exciting. You can tell that they're bought in to to the way that she's come in and, ch and change that program. Um, so that's really exciting. She's a quality human. So see that gone was awesome. And then um, just to see the amount of fans showing up, big SEC play starting this weekend. Florida plays at Alabama. I can't wait to watch that series. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's just a lot of good softball coming up. I'm here today in Clemson. Tennessee plays at Clemson um, in, a, in an amazing midweek. It's like I have my eyes on so much good softball. I'm fired up. Oh, I'm right there with you. I mean, Pac-12 play starts too this weekend. Um, I'm actually going to be broadcasting at Stanford for their last preseason, their last non-conference weekend. They're hosting LMU in Nevada. But then my first games with Pac-12 Network are the following weekend, and it's the Stanford-Cal rivalry. So some of those things coming up, like you and I, we we just love it. We're fired up. Yeah, and how, how many years has it been between like, I mean – at, there was a time where Stanford and Cal were at the bottom of the Pac-12 and, and fighting just to get some wins. And now yep. that you're both extremely, extremely competitive top 25 and playing really, really good softball right now. So not only is it the biggest rivalry for those schools, but also they're really good teams as well. So it's going to be a um, and I can't wait to watch. Oh man, it's going to be super fun. And you all let us know what you think too. Like what else do you want to hear from us? Cause we could do this all day long. So we yeah. appreciate you joining <laughs> us as always. And we'll be back here next week.